conversation before uh, the service started this morning about, you know, um, uh, getting dizzy. Uh, we call it, um, when your ears... Vertigo. Vertigo. Yes, yes. And I said, you know, I find that if I got, stand up really quickly, I get... Yeah, I did that. And it's like, right now, I'm going to kind of just stay planted here until everything between my ears seems to settle its way down. Yeah, I probably was prophetic. Um, didn't need that. All right, so here we go. Okay, good solid base. The, the scripture passage for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. Hear this good word. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell at his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. I... All of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to one another, Who can be saved? Jesus looked up and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied. No one who has left home or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Okay, so... How does one become rich? Well, a famous rich person, John Rockefeller, says there are three things you need to do to be rich. Number one, go to work early. All right. Number two, stay at work late. Now, see, many of you, like the rich young ruler, are thinking, I've done this since my youth, all right? You like, and the third one, the third thing that you have to do to become rich is find oil. <laughs> or maybe a more uh, contemporary, create a successful app. All right? Who is rich? Typically, when we think about someone who is rich, we're not thinking about ourselves. We're pointing to someone who has more stuff than we do, right? Who is rich? At a former pastor, at there was a person who just bought a beautiful 5,000 square foot home in this wealthy community, kind of like Keens Point, Iowa, a golf course by a famous, you know, golf professional, gated, and just beautiful house. And we had a church gathering. And a church gathering, the, the person, the home that we were meeting in, they had some architectural digest magazines laying around. And this individual started picking up and looking through the architectural digest. Oh, man, he said, look at this, look at this estate. I wish I could, I was rich enough to be able to have this place. Oh, look at this one. I wish I was rich enough to have that place. And went through it. And after about five times, I, I finally exploded inside of my head and out of my mouth, which is a dangerous combination. And I just looked at him and said, gosh, I wish I were poor like you. 
Who is rich? It depends on whom you're comparing to. It depends on what standard you're looking at. Everybody in this sanctuary is rich. Everybody. In the world standard, if you had, first of all, breakfast to eat, then you're rich. If you had a choice of what you ate for breakfast, you're extremely rich. If you just got yourself a little bit of something to tide you over so you could go and enjoy a beautiful brunch after worship this morning, you're extremely rich. Because most people in the world don't have food for breakfast, or at least they don't have a choice. This morning when you decided to come to church, and if you have shoes, if you have shoes, you're rich for many people in this world. If you had a choice as to what shoes you chose to wear, you're extremely rich. So when we look at this passage today, it's not talking about some, those people who, as Marge used to say, the people who live behind the big pink wall in Iowa. It's talking to all of us. Why is it so hard for the rich to enter into the kingdom? That's a good question. Why is it so hard? There have been many studies on people who win the lotto. On how winning the lotto changed our life. And a couple of things that I found very interesting that says that if you were an arrogant jerk before you win the lotto, all that money just made you more of an arrogant jerk. <laughs> if you were a kind, compassionate, giving person before you won the lotto, then the lotto helped you to become more kind and more compassionate. It just seems to magnify that. parts of our humanity, right? Wealth does not create happiness. Wealth creates opportunity. The more wealth you have, the greater opportunities you have. Not just to experience things in this world, but opportunities also to give, right? So why is it then the disciples were so baffled by Jesus' comments? Just they screamed out, if it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, it, it, the, 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 then who can be saved? And Jesus said, you know, it's easier for a camel to be threaded through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples were just like... Ugh. How can this be? Well, in the first century, there was a deep-seated belief that a person who was extremely wealthy was blessed by God. People who did not have much and who were miserable were cursed by God. This had been a belief system that had been going on for, for hundreds of years, millennia, right? Those who had much, God blessed. Those who had nothing, God had cursed. That's what we see in, that, in, the, um, in, the, in the book of Job, which is not about a literal person, but that was a protest against that particular belief system. Job had everything in the world, right? And the Satan, who was not an, a fallen angel, but basically God's CIA agent, God says, he went about the world looking at the affairs of men and then came and reported them to God. And God says, well, God, no wonder he's righteous, God. Look, you've given him everything. God says, all right, take it all away, but don't kill him. And somehow Job continued to be faithful and righteous to God when he had nothing. That's what that whole story was about, to challenge that belief system. So the disciples are completely baffled. If the rich can't get into the kingdom of God, then, then who can be saved? So in order to be able to understand this passage 
more deeply, we need to look at the context. I would imagine the disciples who lived very, very um, simply thought, a rich guy coming into our merry band? <laughs> Maybe we won't have to sleep outside. We can stay at the Motel 6. That would have been an upgrade, right? They would have had more than enough to be able to do what they wanted to do in their ministry. But Jesus says, you must do two things. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. Now, when the rich young man came to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We have to look at it in that context of the first century. It wasn't, eternal life was not the same thing that you and I have learned in our church experiences. For us, many of us, the traditions we inherited and grew up in, eternal life is that place you go if you've been good boys and girls. And hell is that place to go if you've been bad boys and girls, right? But in the Jewish theology, there wasn't a sense of heaven as a reward and hell as a punishment. All souls went to Sheol, a place of shadows. In very early Hebrew theology, like the time of Abraham, there wasn't even a concept of eternal life. One's eternity was in giving birth to as many sons with your name as possible. So your genealogy was your eternal life. That's why when you read those stories in the Old Testament and someone that was not able to have a child, they were cursed beyond curses because that means when they die, their name dies and then they cease to exist. But over time, they were the influence of of Babylonians and Persians and Egyptians, the idea of a place of shadows where the soul goes. It was not a bad place. It was not a good place. It was just a place where souls go. And then the belief was that when God ended at the age, the eschaton, the end time, then God would gather up those who had been faithful and put them on the right hand of God and God would punish God's enemies and raise up those who had been faithful. That was the concept of eternal life. His reference and his question to Jesus was based on eschatology, the end time. Now, this is important. When he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life. A more accurate translation of that Greek word is, what must I do to win the lottery to go to, to get eternal life? It meant by lot. So it wasn't guaranteed, no matter how good you were, that you were going to be called up by God in the last day. So now you see how that starts to change the perspective a little bit. The young man was using his obedience to the com commandments of Moses and his wealth, wealth and connection to Jesus to try to get an advantage in the lottery, right? Ah, that changes things a bit, doesn't it? He wasn't asking Jesus, what do I need to do to get to heaven, Jesus? What must I do to win the lottery to get into the kingdom of God? So then Jesus asked him, you kept all the commandments? Yes. Yes, since I was a boy. He must be thinking to himself at this time, I got this. <laughs> Jesus looked at him, and it says he looked at him. The Greek word to look was not just see his presence, but to see his mind. That's the Greek word to look. And he loved him, agape, unconditionally. He looked at him, saw in his mind, and Jesus loved him. He says, there's one more thing. Sell everything that you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Now, mind you, Jesus did not demand this of all of his other followers. It was just this one guy. 
he must have been extremely attached to his wealth. Mary of Magdala historically was known to be a very wealthy woman. She uh, probably owned a, a fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. And she was one of the ones who helped to finance Jesus' ministry. Jesus didn't ask that of her or Joseph of Arimathea, or Nicodemus, or others. He asked it of this guy only, because he must have been extremely attached. And also, it seems like he was trying to use his wealth and his influence to hedge the bets that he's going to win the lotto to get in. When he heard what was required, for him it was too much, too great a price to pay. So this guy who in that moment, I got this, womp, 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 and he walked away sad because he had so much wealth. What must we do to enter the kingdom of God? What must we do to inherit eternal life? What must we do to be in heaven? It takes more than laws and commands and obeying them. It takes more than a dedication to a religious belief system. It takes more than practicing religious and spiritual disciplines. All of those things can help us in the process. But what must we do in order to inherit eternal life? First of all, we don't have to inherit it. It's not a thing of chance. It's an issue of consciousness. Think of the word eternal. It has no beginning and it has no end. Eternity is not linear. It's not chronos, or the Greek word for human time, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Eternity is forever. So it's not something that you have to inherit or get lucky to receive. It's something that you have to become conscious of and live in. In it. Before you entered your mother's womb, you were eternal. While you live in this life and on this earth and, and, and navigate what you need to do to fulfill your destiny on this planet, you, your soul is eternal. And when our bodies breathe their last breath, that which is truly us will continue to live on because we are eternal. Eternal life is living consciously in that realm. Not being so distracted and living and being motivated strictly by our ego. And those things which are material. I find it interesting. That when we're young, we want to accumulate and we want to get a, we get our first house and then we have more we need to get a bigger house because we got a lot more stuff to put in it and then as we get older we accumulate more stuff so we need to get a bigger house to accumulate that and it seems like then as you spend the last 20 years of your life you're letting all of that go and you're downsizing right yeah cause accumulating things and physical wealth is no longer the priority it's a quality of life, a quality of being on this planet. That, my friends, is what I believe is eternal life. In my previous tradition, the idea, Todd, you know this, once saved, always saved. The whole emphasis was getting you to say the prescribed prayer and follow the prescriptive process of getting saved. When you got saved, you had your ticket to heaven. If you didn't get saved through that process, then you were going to go down a grease slide to hell. Those were your choices. Back when I got saved, or if you want to add the extra vowels, saved, 
<laughs> if those are my two options, I was smart enough to follow the prescribed prayer, get myself baptized, and get on with my eternal life. But what I've learned since then, it's not following the spiritual disciplines. It's not following the religious rules that guarantee eternal life is not something that you, that you go through some prescription to have. It's something that is you already. It's just how conscious of you are of you. How conscious are you of it? And how deeply do you know who you are? And how deeply do you connect with the divine which is in you? I came across a post, Facebook, I think it was yesterday, and I thought it was pretty funny, but it was very telling as well, regarding that getting saved, your ticket to heaven. Hey, conservative Christians, getting to spend eternity with you is not the selling point you seem to think it is. <laughs> <laughs> The kingdom of heaven, eternal life, the kingdom of God is not a destination, but it is rather a reality that we become more and more conscious of. And as we become more and more conscious of it, then we live more deeply in it. It's something that we have before we come. It's something that we have while we're here. And it's something that we have when we leave. What helped me to become more conscious in my spiritual journey were a couple of things. Because of my conservative Protestant upbringing, I knew the Bible. You had to know it. You got shamed if you didn't. But I learned those stories. I know those stories. And there are so many times when I've encountered challenges in life, it's those stories that will pop up and those stories that restore me, those stories that give me the insight and the wisdom that I need in the moment. It's the stories. I know the stories. It's so funny. Amy and I were watching this series on, uh, on Disney Channel called What If? And it's about Marvel characters that what would have happened to them if they, uh, in another multiverse, where they would have done something differently to shift things. And in one of them, one of the Marvel heroes wanted something to rise up off the ground, and he used the, uh, the, the, the lifting up spell from Harry Potter with Harmony. Harmony, is that her name? Hermione, you know, and he did that spell to make that thing. I'm thinking, okay, how funny is that? He, who, the person who wrote that into the storyline knew the Harry Potter stories and was able to make use of that reference from Harry Potter and a Marvel action series, right? The stories, it's the stories that have given me a foundation to help lift me up and to keep me in, 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 grounded. I love the stories. The second thing for me was meditation, and still is. Because through meditation, I let go of all that I inherited. I let go of the theology that was not particularly sound. I let go of the, um, the hocus-pocus belief systems that were thrust upon me. And through meditation, it's a deliberate act to connect deeply and consciously with oneself. And I have found that both of those disciplines have helped me to become more and more conscious of the eternal realm and where I fit in it and how I'm living in it than anything else. It has nothing to do with wealth, it has nothing to do with religious practices, but it has everything to do with what tools I had, what tools do you have to help you to connect deeply and intimately with the eternal. It's not an issue of chance. It's an issue of persistence and determination and expanding your consciousness to live in that realm. <sighs> All right. I'm worn out. I'm sure you are. <laughs> My friends, who you are is eternal. Who you are is already connected deeply with God. Who you are is beautiful, powerful. 
who you are was sent here to fulfill a purpose. And the more deeply you're connected to that deep inner spirit, then the more focused you'll be and the more clarity you'll have as to who you truly are and how you go about fulfilling God's purpose in this world. That's enough for today. God bless you all. God keep you and go with peace and purpose. Amen.